If you're just joining us, we're going to get started in just a minute. We're just waiting to give people a chance to sign in. Okay, we're going to get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lisa May, and I'm the Program Officer and Director of Services and Programs for People with Disabilities at Children, Jewish Children and Family Services of Greater Philadelphia. Wow, I can just say how wonderful it is to have so many folks here. We're at over 100 people here tonight, and we have people represented from about 14 states, so we're just very excited. Um, before I kick things off, I'd like to go over some logistics and make a few introductions. First, we have a wonderful ASL interpreter. Thanks so much to Nancy Levine for being here this evening. If you'd like to turn on closed captioning, simply click on the up arrow next to the CC or closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen, then select caption settings and then drag the dot across the bar. You can make it larger or smaller as needed. So for those who need, you can put it to the maximum and make it large. I am a white woman in my early 60s with long brown hair. I'm wearing a royal blue shirt with a black blazer. And in my background, there is a blue green wall with two paintings hanging on the wall. One additional comment, if you have any technical difficulties um, or questions regarding technology, please put um, your request in the chat and our technological um, person will try to help you out. Just so everyone is aware, we will be accepting questions throughout the presentation and we have reserved the last 10 minutes to answer them. To ensure that your question is seen, please submit them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a Q&A feature there. You just hit on it and you can type in your question. Also, you may have noticed we're going to be closing the chat feature. It will turn on for the last 10 minutes of the program. And please know that we will not be able to answer every single question in the time that we have, but we will definitely do our best. This year is the 14th anniversary of Jewish Disability Awareness, Acceptance, and Inclusion Month, also known as JDAM. It was founded in 2009 to raise awareness for the lives of people with disabilities and to support their right to be included in all aspects of Jewish life. Every year at JFCS, we host a virtual program in honor of JDAM. This year, we are delighted to have Dr. Sandy Greenberg. I'd like to thank him for being with us here this evening. I'd also, also like to thank our partners, Jewish Learning Venture and the Jewish Community Relations Council, JCRC, of the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia. Jewish Learning Venture empowers families raising Jewish children to make Judaism meaningful and relevant for themselves, as well as ensuring that families raising Jewish children with disabilities find the support and accommodations needed for full inclusion in Jewish life. JCRC educates and advocates in Greater Philadelphia in Congress and our state capital on behalf of Jewish interests and issues throughout our region, in Israel, and around the world. And here at JFCS, we support individuals with disabilities, their families, and their caregivers, helping them achieve the highest level of independence, a sense of community, and an enhanced quality of life. We help with navigating life's challenges, transitions, employment, and emotional and mental well being through counseling, care management, and other support services. We will include the links to all of our organizations in the chat at the end of the presentation in case you'd like to learn more. And now, without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce our guests for this evening. Interviewing Dr. Greenberg is Gabrielle Kaplan Mayer. Jewish Learning Ventures Chief Program Officer and Director of their Whole Community Inclusion Initiative. She is the proud recipient of the 2022 Covenant Award and her most recent book, The Little Gate Crasher, is a memoir of her great uncle who overcame society's prejudices about dwarfism to lead a remarkable life. She's also written a journal created for fellow parents raising children with disabilities. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce inventor, author, public servant, and philanthropist, Dr. Sandy D. Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg is the author of the book, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, How Daring Dreams and Unyielding Friendship Turn One Man's Blindness into an Extraordinary Vision for Life. Dr. Greenberg is the chairman of the Board of Governors of Johns Hopkins University's Wilmer Eye Institute, the largest clinical and research enterprise in ophthalmology in the United States. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He is a trustee emeritus of Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Medicine, which incorporates the School of Medicine and the hospital. 
We will put the link to his website in the chat as well at the end of the program so you can learn more about him. And of course, he has one incredible story to share. And on that note, I'll turn things over to Gabrielle and Dr. Greenberg. Please enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Lisa. I want to thank my friends and colleagues at JFCS of Greater Philadelphia for partnering with us on this program, as well as our friends at the JCRC, and to all of you who are here tonight for this conversation. Um, Dr. Greenberg's book is riveting. I have been enjoying reading it so much. And Dr. Greenberg, I am just thrilled to be in this conversation with you. I wanna begin by talking about your beginnings. You have led a life of exceptional achievement but you had modest roots. Can you describe for us your childhood in Buffalo? Yes, be happy to. Let me put it this way. Um, there were four pillars that made it possible for me to flourish as a young boy. Um, and they were two different types of pillars. One was just the normal emotional love that you get from good parents and grandparents. And the other was a spiritual uh, pillar, which uh, enriched me to an extent that it's carried through my entire life to this very moment. We lived in a flimsy wooden house on one of the benighted sections of Buffalo. And I knew that it was very difficult for both my father and mother to um, carry on the way they were. It turns out that my father, Albert, came over uh, after escaping from the Nazis in 1939. He was an immigrant tailor, and I must say a very good one at that. But he didn't have too much time to spend with his children because he had to figure out how to support them. And one day, he asked me to come into the living room, and I sat down in a chair, and he dropped a stick of gum on my head and told me it was coming from heaven. He died shortly thereafter uh, when I was five, and his death devastated me. He left my mother, Sarah, with $54 and three children to raise. My mother immediately went to a social service agency to ask for assistance. And they agreed they'd be happy to help out so long as she put her three children into three separate orphanages. Mm. Uh, that was not a good point to make to my mother. She would never separate her family regardless of the circumstances. So we all stayed together and she went to work at the Curtis Wright Aircraft Corporation, which made airplane parts for the World War II effort. Uh, and she also had with her, her mother, our grandmother, which was perhaps the best blessing of all. And uh, my grandmother was from I would call it a little nowhere place in Eastern Europe. And one day as she was babysitting, a spring from the cradle burst into her eye, requiring her to get a prosthetic. Being with her to me was like being anointed. It was almost as though you weren't worthy of being with her. Mm 
when she died. She took something sacred with her that I shared with her. But fortunately, she left something sacred too. My mother, Sarah, married my uncle Carl five years after my first father died. He was a junk dealer. And while it certainly was not a glamorous occupation, he made enough to enable us to move out of our um, flimsy wooden house to a more respectable place on Saranac Avenue. And uh, that really opened up the world for we children. Hmm. I would say that's, well, oh, one other thing. One day, a disgruntled employee in his shop heaved a brick at him, catching him in the eye. And he too, like my grandmother Pauline, required a prosthetic eye. So, uh, one of the uh, the fates looking down at us from above might say, what an obscene irony. And it was. But fortunately, because of the, those four pillars are we, the children, all lived a rich life which we've carried through our lives all of these years. That was the beginning. That is an incredible depiction of your childhood. And for anyone who hasn't re yet read the book, I encourage you to read it. Um, you paint such a vivid picture, Dr. Greenberg. And you went from being that poor Jewish kid from Buffalo to earning a scholarship to attend Columbia University. What was that like to arrive at Columbia and have that experience at the university? Well, in the first instance, it was a blessing, needless to say. I found the passion for learning on the part of the faculty, simply stunning. And most of the students also felt that way. I felt as though I was being initiated in the most treasured secrets of knowledge from the continents and the millennia. I don't know how else to say that uh, it was one of the most enriching experiences of my life. Although on the other side, it was the situs for one of my uh, most difficult times. Can, can you tell us about that experience? You were in college, I believe you were 19 years old when you went through the trauma of waking up from, from surgery blind after having your sight for 19 years. Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, it started out with a benign baseball game. I was pitching right before I returned from my junior year. 
And suddenly my eyes became cloudy and steamy and things became detached from each other so that the red thread on the ball separated from my wrist and the trees seemed to come apart. I threw a ball and almost hit a batter. And I knew that the time had come for me to leave the mound, which I did and stumbled to the sidelines and dropped to the ground. And my girlfriend, Sue, happened to be there to see this. and. Uh, I laid down on the ground and she put my head on her lap and she asked me what had happened. And I told her I didn't know except I couldn't see for a while. And those episodes occurred from time to time. I went to see an ophthalmologist and he gave me a medicine that was for people who had allergic conjunctivitis, which I did not have. And that medicine failing, I went to another ophthalmologist who was allegedly the best doctor in Erie County. And he, as it turns out, misdiagnosed my disease. He too thought it was allergic conjunctivitis when in fact it was glaucoma. And he issued some topical steroids that I was supposed to take twice a day. And uh, assuming that this was the right thing to do, I took the drops twice a day. And over time, they simply poisoned my eyes corrupted them so that by end of the year, um, I was unable to see. And um, from that experience with that doctor giving you the wrong the wrong medication eventually when you did see the correct specialist that's when he said you would you would need surgery can can you tell us about that part of the experience after the experience with the two doctors we talked to a number of people and we found out that there was a doctor Saul Sugar who was a glaucoma specialist in Detroit. There were three in the country, one in Boston, one in San Francisco, one in Detroit. The only one available was Dr. Sugar. So my mother and I took a train to Detroit, registered in the Statler Hotel, went to see him late afternoon, and it was a cold winter day in Detroit. Uh, but the sun came streaming through the Venetian blinds, and that's the room that Dr. Sugar put me on a table, which he called a tonogram. And he started screaming because my eye pressure was simply um, off the scale. When he was done screaming about the they, I didn't know what he meant. He took me over to this stool and examined my eyes. He had very bushy eyebrows. I remember that. And he took his ophthalmoscope and spent quite a long time putting it on my eye. And then suddenly he stood up. And there was a tearing of his eyebrows mm. of mine. He looked ahead, straight ahead, I surmised. 
and as though he weren't talking to anyone, despite the fact that my mother and I were sitting in front of him, he said, well, son, you are going to be blind tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I finished the sentence in my mind, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. There was nothing else I could say. He said, I'll schedule a surgery for tomorrow. And as sure as I was there, I couldn't see after that. Thank you for sharing that story with us, Dr. Greenberg. I, um, in the book, it was so riveting to read. And again, I encourage people to pick up Hello Darkness and to go through that entire experience of you being a 19 year old at Columbia and going through that news and going through the surgery and staying in the hospital and what we learn in the book, what you describe in your story is some incredible support that was around you. The title of the book, Hello Darkness, we recognize that lyric. You had an incredible friendship with your Columbia roommate who, whose name we recognize as Art Garfunkel. And so I want to switch gears for a minute and you you were living with art before um before getting this news and before going through your surgery and can you tell us how this friendship with him changed your life now that's a pleasurable story having been rather dour for the last few minutes i apologize but arthur and i met in 1958 we were freshmen and we were at an orientation session. And he came over to me and shook my hand and for reasons that turned out to be a blessing. We became good friends. And at the end of our freshman year, he uh, came over and he said, uh, I think we should room together and I'm going to give you five reasons. And one of the reasons, which to me is the most relevant, he said, we will create a pact that if one person is in crisis, the other would attend to him immediately. that actually had, has lasted until today. Mm -hmm. And there's a long, long history that I can't, don't have the time to go into it. Suffice it to say, one day we were leaving humanities class and we walked out onto Amsterdam, Amsterdam Avenue and about 118th and he looked down and he said, Sanford, Look at this piece of grass. And I didn't know what to make of that. My other friends, you could call them jocks or workaholics or just plain students. Uh, but the beauty of nature was surely not on our list of things to appreciate. And he said, now look at this seriously, Sam. Do you see how the light illuminates the beauty and complexities of its color? And then my life changed. Well, in the in the book, I loved reading about your friendship 
all of the things you shared and the way that he helped you during that um, that first year when you returned to Columbia. And I want to, first of all, I want to just say your sharing of your story, it was, it was a be beautiful to hear, not dour, but just beautiful to understand what you went through and to hear the experience of it. And so many people go through difficult things. And this was just an incredible challenge you faced. But the year after that surgery, after going blind, you not only returned to Columbia, but you graduated Phi Beta Kappa. You were the Columbia class president. You went on to study law and you received a PhD from Harvard, an MBA from Columbia, a Marshall Scholarship to Oxford, a White House Fellowship, and this was all in an era before por portable recording devices and streaming lectures were available. So can you please explain to us, what do you, to what do you attribute your extraordinary academic success? I say in the book that there are <clears throat> two very important things in the world people and ideas. And I would say that actually those two ideas were responsible for whatever success I've had. I could list seriatim the incredible people who helped me. I could talk to you about the ideas that were given to me by our faculty with, as I said earlier, with such passion that you, you just, you had to learn, you wanted to learn, changes your life. And I would credit my then girlfriend, Sue, who subsequently became my wife and still is, my college roommate, as you know, Art Garfunkel, my other college roommate, Jerry Spire, my siblings, my children. But before all of that happened, it happened to be that the uh, there were four or five people, but because of them, many other people came to help. There, there were readers at Columbia. You had to ask the faculty to help find them for you, unless you had some friends. At Harvard, they have something called Phillips Brooks House, so that anyone entering can has a choice, one of which is reading to a blind student. And plenty of people. <laughs> and so I would say that without the generosity of heart that these readers had and without the ideas that underpinned Western civilization, I wouldn't have made it. Wow. Well, you went on from your incredible studies and academic career to having a remarkable career in as an innovator in business. And one of your inventions, the compressed speech machine was a game changer for millions of blind people and has also helped shape the world as we hear it today. Can you describe what sparked the idea for this invention and how it works? As you mentioned, 
after I lost my eyesight, I returned to Columbia my senior year. And uh, I had this reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. I don't know if any of you remember those things. Um, but I used to try and speed up the reels so that I could get my work done more efficiently. Unfortunately, what I got when I sped the tape up was distortion. And it was very frustrating, and I used to break a lot of tapes the way I did that. And one night I sat back and I said, well, wait a minute. Why am I doing this? If your goal is to speed up sound without distortion, you're not going to get it this way. And so I started doing research that was relatively aimless. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And um, finally, that summer after I graduated, I said, well, I reasoned that if we've been communicating principally by speaking and listening for these many thousands of years, and Gutenberg came along with the printing press only 500 years ago, that we might be able genetically to listen as rapidly as we could read. And that's when I decided to invent the machine. But it was a dream. And I got to Harvard and some of these readers, as it turns out, happened to be engineers and physicists. And I had been blessed by taking a course in physics from Leon Letterman at Columbia, who subsequently won the Nobel Prize. So I had at least a modest grounding in understanding some of the concepts of physics. Um, so these people helped me. And over time, by continuing to talk to people about this. Uh, I discovered that um, Mr. Capel, who was the chief executive officer of AT&T, that his company had a consent decree against them from working in the area that I was working in, which was vertical compression, theirs was horizontal compression. And he introduced me to a doctor, Dr. M.R. Schroeder, that had a speech and acoustics lab there. And this man was so generous, he gave me free computer time. He introduced me to patent counsel. He got me attorneys. It was uh, truly the biggest break of my life. And by 1969, I had the fundamental patents in the field of electronic compression expansion speech. Wow. That is, that is incredible. Um, you have not only contributed through your through your invention and your work, but also as a philanthropist, you have a campaign called End Blindness. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. I'll try and summarize it because I suspect I've been a little too long-winded here. Uh, no, you're just fine. Uh, in um, 1961, as I mentioned before, I was in Detroit Sinai Hospital, my eyes newly dead, and I lay there in some degree of despair. And I grew up as a religious kid in a, in a religious family. And uh, I was in such a state of aggravation 
that I promised God that for the rest of my life, I would do everything I could to make sure that no one else would go blind. Mm -hmm. Which, if you think about it, was totally insane. You know, I was a blind 19-year-old kid with no money, no resources. I was a dropout. Not a pretty picture. And, of course, science wasn't anywhere near to being able to make a proposition of that sort. So when I left, over the decades, I continued to pursue the science as best I could, not being a scientist. And uh, finally, in the uh, early part of this century, there were some breakthroughs that were quite astonishing. And uh, as you all know, because of Moore's law, the pace of science and technology um, goes pretty rapidly. And by the time I had been asked to be chairman of the Board of Governors of the Wilmer Eye Institute in 2010, I was ready to really think about what could be done. And I talked with Sue. And we decided in order to incentivize the most brilliant minds of this generation to offer the prize to the person or persons who contributed most to ending blindness. And on December 20th of 2020, December 14th, apologies, 2020. Uh, if you want to see the prize ceremony, which would also give you a summary of where the science in this field stands, you can get it by uh, looking at endblindnessnow.com. So that was the beginning. And it turned out to be so successful. And by that, I mean that the people in different parts of the world were becoming interested in this crazy notion. And so the Johns Hopkins University asked Sue and me if they could create the Sanford and Susan Greenberg Center to End Blindness. And as of now, it's the only facility in the world devoted solely to ending blindness forever for everyone. And we are um, raising significant sums of money that will be applied to the researchers and what I decided to do when we set up our original prize, we split it. There were prizes for the people who had achieved much and there were prizes for the people who were yet to achieve, visionary scientists. And so when you look around in the world of science, you notice that the way the National Institutes of Health work is that you get plenty of grant money at about the average age of 44. So what does a very bright, promising student prior to that time do? Not much. They can't get anywhere near the funding that the senior professor to get. So I said, all this money is going to go to these younger people. We call them rising professorships.
Well, we're going to add that link into the chat for everyone. It's endblindnessnow.com. So you can learn more about what Dr. Greenberg's describing. Um, and it, it's fascinating to think about um, this kind of research that that um, you're supporting Dr. Greenberg. I, I want to know for everyone who's listening now through this whole conversation, you've had the experience of, of your life since age 19, a before and after. And so what is it that you want people who see to know about people who can't? Well, unfortunately, the history of our culture has embedded in it very, very terrible images of blind people. You know, they're sinners, as in Odysseus's case, I mean, Oedipus's case. They're considered poor, unable to do anything, really. And so down the ages, that's been one of the fundamental uh, reasons why blind people have such a hard time. And by that, I mean today in the United States of America, 70% of blind people are unemployed. There's no other group that comes close to that. And there are problems attendant to that that are legion. But I don't want to go into those now. So, you see, on the one hand, there is this poor image. On the other, there's the case of Tiresias, who one day sees Athena bathing, and she blinds him. And Tiresias' mother goes to Athena and pleads, pleads for the return of sight to her son. And Athena says, no, I will not give you sight to see the physical world, but I'll give you sight to see the future. And so suddenly, blind people are seers, when the only seers are people who can see. And uh, it's sort of mixed up in terms of how you translate that down to answer your question. I think the bottom line is treat them like you treat anybody else. That's, that, that gives them dignity and shows that you care about them. Mm -hmm. Can, can you tell us, Dr. Greenberg, um, uh, about the process of writing your, your book? Why did you decide to write it? And what do you think is the most important takeaway? As you know, in my junior year and senior year, I began uh, my journey into the world of the wine. And when I got to graduate school, I was filled with experiences that I had obviously never encountered before. And almost by rote, I sat down 
and type 40 pages on my Smith Corona typewriter, talking about what it was like to go through my junior and senior year. And then I put it away. For four years, I left it languishing on my, uh, in my study. And when I was ready, whatever that means, I took the 40 pages down and I started writing the rest of it. Well, sometimes good things do grow finer in time, as we know, because yeah. it's such a powerful book. So you must have been ready to write it. And I want to ask you a question that someone wrote in our Q&A. So if anyone else has a question, um, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. This is from Nancy Einstein. And she asked, what was your reaction when first hearing Art Garfunkel's song, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend? <laughs> you, you have to understand, just to, to be clear, the way the title came about was not the way you think. Because as Arthur had promised, when we got back to Columbia, when I got back, he read to me, and Arthur, who sometimes can be a bit of a smart alecky guy, um, says, Sanford, darkness is going to read to you now from the Iliad, or Sanford, darkness is going to read the times to you. And so he became darkness. And that's what I've called him ever since. Mm. Let's Apple see. darkness, my old friend. Anything happening at, happening after that, I have no <laughs> claim on. Well, I was intrigued in the book to read uh, that you gave him the money, even when you were a poor graduate student yourself, to get his first guitar to, or to purchase the guitar that he wanted. So that that was quite an act of friendship. What what would you do? If this guy is saving your life and you have an opportunity right then and there to repay him, it was a gift. Yeah. And I, I I remember not telling my wife that she was going to have $4 left in her banking account. Um, but we've gotten over that. Amazing. So I have one more question. Uh, this is coming from Carl Schneider. And he's curious, Dr. Greenberg, about what assistance you use when you're just moving about. Do you use a cane, a guide dog, or any other sort of assistance? Um, the guides I use have two legs. with human beings. For years, I used nothing. Uh, after I got through the subway odyssey that Arthur concocted. Uh, and in more recent years, uh, I find it much more convenient and more fun being with somebody. And in addition to writing in the book about being in college and having art and your, your other roommate there who really supported your return and helped you in those early years, your, your wife, Sue, who was your girlfriend at that time and then later fiance, also was a, a really important part of your transition um, when you weren't able to see any longer. And I'm, I'm curious, as we're coming towards the close of our time together, I don't wanna um, go without asking, what, what was it that made the bond between the two of you um, so special through all these years? That's a very good question. 
I'll try and truncate the answer so that we can let the people participating in this get some rest. Um, in sixth grade, uh, I walked into a new school after my mother had remarried. And I looked across the room and there was the most beautiful girl becoming a woman I've ever seen. I had ever seen at that time. Remember, I was in sixth grade. But she never talked to me in sixth grade or seventh grade or eighth grade. And of course, that was the most natural thing in the world because I never spoke to her. In eighth grade, there was a spelling contest. And the word to be spelled was silhouette. She misspelled it. So I was left with the choice of spelling it correctly, which she might not take too kindly to, or misspelling, which just didn't sound right. So I spelled it right, gave a few prayers in the process, and um, she took notice of me for the first time, or at least for the first time I know about it. And uh, in high school, uh, I asked her out on a date to go to the annual cancer charity ball. And when she accepted, I was ecstatic. And then we got married. Now, the central point I want to make here is that, as I said before, right after I went blind, I had no money, I had no eyes, I had no resources, I had no future. And by the way, I was a dropout as well. So why would she stay with me? And that the answer to that question is the reason why she is the hero of this book. Mm. Well, that is a love story, and um, it, it's a really beautiful way to close tonight. But there is one more one more question, Dr. Greenberg, that someone who's watching this um, Zoom stream onto Facebook asked. And so, it, is it okay? Can I ask you one more question? Sure. Okay. Well, it, it was a question just about the emotions that you've dealt with over the years since this news at age 19. And not only just generally the emotions you went through, but I think it, it would be a very human thing to have resentment towards that first doctor who gave you the, the eye drops mistakenly. And, and just the, the person wanted to know how you coped with that if you had resentment towards that doctor? Um, I learned early on, for example, at, when I returned to Columbia, that what Harry Truman said was right. He said, I have no time for bitterness. And to me, it was a waste of time. There were so many things that I had to accomplish that I didn't have room for resentment. Well, clearly you have accomplished so much. And I think I think that those are those are words that we can all take with us and ponder with whatever challenges we may have in our life. Um, it, it's such wisdom and um this was such a just a wonderful and really enlightening opportunity. Um, I feel like I learned so much from you by reading the book and this opportunity to get to sit and listen with you and to hear from you has been 
um, just very, very meaningful for me. And I want to encourage everyone who has not yet read the book to get your copy of Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, to share it with friends and loved ones, and to really take all of Dr. Greenberg's messages that we've learned here tonight, um, both his, his commitment, his resilience, his philanthropy, his campaign to end blindness, and, um, and, and really the grace through which he's lived. And, and, um, and I want to lift up the power of friendships and relationships, because I think we're also, Dr. Greenberg, you're, you're very gracious in not only illuminating your story, but really to talk about your, your college friends, your dear, dear friends, and your dear beloved wife who have, um, who have really journeyed with you. So thank you so much for this conversation. My pleasure. Thank you. And I just want to chime in so well said Gabrielle and Dr. Dr. Greenberg, such a, a wonderful, interesting, engaging conversation. And we thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights and thoughts and your, your life experience. Um, I just want to also say thank you to Gabrielle and Nancy, our interpreter. Thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Greenberg, for being here. Um, I hope you found this as engaging and interesting as, as I did as well. And if you're moved by what you heard tonight, um, I hope you'll consider getting involved either by giving or volunteering. Uh, we have lots of opportunities at JFCS at the People Living with Disabilities Program. And you can check out the links in the chat to our other organizations and, as well. And just wanna say thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, thank you. you, Dr. Greenberg.